Uh, now I got a live stream message, so that's good. Of course. All right, guys, it's good to go now. Um, sorry about that. I'm going to, yeah, three, two, one, you're in. Welcome, everybody, back here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in, in New York City in the middle of Midtown Manhattan. It's a, a great day for us at the Siegel Center. It's the start of our spring 2023 season. And um, we are uh, continuing our uh, Siegel talks that became uh, um, um, our contribution in the time of Corona to um, the landscape, the field of theater um, and performance. Today, I have with me two great workers in the theater. It's a choreographer, Michael Klein, who is with us and a researcher and theater artist, Corey Tamler. And both of them are with us because we produced um, a book together. I think it's a very important book, also a very beautifully done uh, uh, um, book. And the book is called A Permanent Parliament, Notes on Social um, Choreography. So I welcome um, both of you here. Just a few words before. Before we start, um, we are uh, really honored to, to be back on HowlRound, and we uh, welcome everybody listening uh, to us um, here um, on uh, our uh, Siegel talk. In the time of Corona, we had over 200 talks, uh, most probably with our film festival on theater and performance during Corona time, and the HowlRound for India, the New York Theater Artists for Ukraine. We had over 200,000 listeners, and it turned out that we were the most active theater center uh, worldwide, and it's a great uh, tradition. Luckily, performances have started again. There are now so many, many talks, and um, and we are thrilled to be, uh, again, um, a part of the fabric of theater that is so urgently um, needed. But we have to ask uh, what to do now. Uh, it's now the new times we live in, and we are developing new forms, and this is why we think this uh, conversation today is a contribution um, to it. Um, Michael, and uh, Corey um, worked together. We hosted a workshop at the Siegel Center about Michael's work. And um, But let's first introduce both of you. Um, Corey, uh, where are you right now? Um, what time is it? It is, it's 5.36 uh -huh. in the early evening. I'm in Berlin, um, where I've been living since the fall of 2021. And mm -hmm. yeah, spring is coming slowly. Very yeah. slowly, as it does in Berlin. How about you, Michael? I'm sitting here in my office at Duke University, North Carolina, same time as New York. A uh, little bit jet lag, just came back from Greece yesterday. So if I look a little bit absent-minded, stare into the void, stick with me. <laughs> so tell us a bit about yourself. Not everybody knows you and your work. Tell us a little bit what you do. Oh, I'm a, uh, I'm a choreographer. I uh, have been sort of choreographer for the last 30 years, uh, working with uh, initially as a sort of independent choreographer for many years, working also with Ballet Frankfurt, with William Forsythe, uh, and moving here to Duke University as a professor for dance, for the practice of dance, and starting the Laboratory for Social Choreography about two years ago now at the Keenan Institute for Ethics. Uh, I'm concerned with sort of expansive choreography for many years now and the praxis of expanding uh, both what dance and choreography could mean in society. Fantastic. Thank you. And Corey? Yeah, I am, these days I would call myself a writer and performance maker. Um, I am uh, coming from a theater background um, and moved from kind of my earlier earlier days in as a playwright and director into also kind of more expanded practices and participatory and uh, collaboratively created work. Um, I work with a collective in Maine um, in uh, along water bodies in Maine. So that's been a really important kind of central 
ongoing collaboration the last eight years or so. Um, and uh, yeah, also do some translation. Translation work. And so, oh, um, this is, that's the thing I wanted to say. I'm also, of course, in the, I knew there was something else. That's why I trailed off. I'm in, I'm a PhD candidate in the program in theater and performance at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, so I am also, I'm also a performance scholar um, and come kind of came to this book as, as a form of kind of marrying theory and practice in writing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, tell us a bit, how, how did the idea, how did it start for the book? Well, as Frank mentioned, as you mentioned, Frank, we had a, a, we had a, a session of Parliament, um, which is the piece of social choreography that the book engages with at the Siegel Center. I think it was in December 2018. Um, although the roots of it are a few years before that, um, when Michael and I met at the New Museum for Contemporary Art, which is also in New York City. And I was doing a fellowship there in performance curation with Travis Chamberlain and Michael um, had a project along with Steve, his dramaturg, Steve Falk, um, together with the Martha Graham Company, the Martha Graham Dance Company um, and other, and uh, also bringing in some other people from, from around the city. Um, and it is, it was a, also like a piece of, well, Parliament actually was part of it, um, was a sort of, at a sort of deeper layer was part of this work. Um, I didn't know that at the time, I wasn't familiar with Parliament, um, but it was part of the way in which Michael was working mm -hmm. with the dancers who were part of Graham Company at the time. And any, anyway, I was sort of part of that project as sort of curatorial support and production support during this fellowship. I interviewed Michael, I interviewed Steve, um, and was, was part of the sort of day-long performance event itself as well and got to know their work that way. And I ended up writing about it um, about a year later, maybe. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a short article that then was published um, in yeah, an maybe, academic maybe. journal. So we sort of started, like we sort of, we, that, that kind of emerged out of, um that relationship kind of emerged out of out of that first encounter at the new museum and then we we stayed in touch over the coming years and michael came to and and we're talking about how to bring how to make parliament happen in new york um yeah. that didn't totally answer your i can keep i it can did. keep going no, no, no. I think it's that's, very, the, very that's good. the beginning of our relationship and the very very beginnings of sort of writing with some of michael's work but is not about then the book itself how the book itself started no a parliament is an important project it in a way falls and into um, that category of socially engaged art or we you know it is called this term social choreography which is very important we will talk about it later it's something that happens in these the spaces between the white cube and the black box, something also Claire Bishop writes and cares uh, so much about. Michael, um, someone who has never seen Parliament, who doesn't really know this kind of radical notion, how you reinvented uh, what choreography is about, what a dance is about. Uh, um, uh, tell us a bit what it is. Well, what it is, is like a an artificial or a sensory deprivation chamber for for humans uh, to stick to come together and over the course of a number of hours usually it's four to six hours sometimes it's a bit shorter uh without any furniture in the space without any kind of sound you know music as such or sound without you don't have your devices on you you don't have anything to, to play with no objects as such other than your clothes uh and you spend without language four hours let's say uh just observing yourself observing the other and then there's very simple kind of propositions that are shared within the very beginning of it that lasts about 10 15 minutes how to think about this situation how to kind of expand this situation and how to negotiate relationships outside of social codes so 
you don't use any of the established language. So it's really a negotiation outside of language over four hours. You can do whatever you want. It's not participatory in a traditional way. You're not being forced by anybody to participate, but everybody's in it. There's no out. It's one, it's one space. Even if you sleep through the four hours, you're in it and you're going to affect others. So it's a space where you really become aware that you, you know, of affecting and being affected the entire time of this recursive relationship we're in, in the social. Yeah, so just to, to make it even clearer for our audience, traditionally in theater spaces, you buy a ticket, you sit in your seat and you see what master artists are doing, what a master director choreographer did. In uh, the parliament idea, is a big space, an empty space. Everybody comes inside. Some, as it happened at the season, also Martha Graham dancers who adore and like uh, Michael's work. So they, people are all together in a space over a period of time, start, at least that's what happened with us, flying back on their backs. But you have a couple of rules or you give a couple of, not rules, you give a couple of suggestions mm -hmm. of what to do. Tell us a bit about it. Well, usually I don't, necessarily share them out i mean i think they're in the book as well yeah. uh, but it's they're very simple they're sort of so so simple that it took a long time to come up with such simple rules that create such a complex field at the end when you when you run it uh, but it's mainly about observing yourself observing the other lie sit stand move as a thought body like do not kind of try to uh, distinguish uh you know a body that thinks or a uh a thinker that moves, try to just keep in movement while you're thinking. Uh, and then there are a few others like do not be creative, do not have ideas. And that that throws a lot of people off this notion of there's no need here to, to feel like you need to, to do anything, to be anything. Things will unfold. The, the more you're just attuned with your senses, uh, the more things will unfold by themselves. How was it for you, Carl? The, the instructions are in the book, but that was, that was, um, they are and they aren't. That was also a discussion for us in, um, in putting the book together. Should, how much should these, this set of instructions be in, in the book? Um, and you could sit there and sort of transcribe the 10 or 20 minutes that it takes to deliver these instructions. Um, and this, of course, we didn't do. And so mm -hmm. uh, so the book sort of has one version because Michael always draws, does this kind of big drawing along with the score, sort of draws it out on the floor. And so this exists as ephemera from each one of the versions of Parliament. So we have a we we have the image of that drawing of the instructions from from the seagull that's reproduced in the book. And then um, and then we talk about what the instructions were, but without trying to reproduce them in a way where you would then think, I can, I can just take these and do it. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us a bit, Corey, how you participated. How, how was it for you? Again, for the audience, you come in a room, if you participate, let's say the armory in New York would do it, maybe a hundred or 200 people would be let in. They would be lying, I guess, in the beginning on the floor and they experience themselves and um, the, the humans next to them and the space over a very long time. It's a radical uh, in his approach. The choreographer removes himself. He's not even in the room. It's an absence actually of an author, of, a, of, a, of the director, of a game, uh, a game leader. So, but how was it for you as a person? Tell us a little bit what happened for you when you did it the first time. Yes, well, I've only done it once. Um... And we what the version that I participated in was at kind of the the lower limit of the amount of time that it really makes sense to do Parliament. Um, so I think it was just three. It was three hours, and that was that was the time that we had. And in those situations, so Michael was not part of it. He did totally leave the room, um, which is not to say that he doesn't ever participate. I mean, you can also talk about that. But in this case, it was he. What he said to me was, "It doesn't make sense for me to be part of it because then there will be there will be an author because you have those that beginning the, that the beginning of." arriving at what parliament is, what the effect is that it has on you. This, it takes, there's kind of this void and this confusion and you 
you're sort of lost in this set of instructions that are too big to, um, this is now, was my experience of it, that, I, that the set of instructions seemed at first really too big for me to hold it in my head. And so you feel lost for at least the first 45 minutes or so. If someone who you then knew was the choreographer or the person who had created this work were to then be in the room in, those, in that first bit of confusion, you would be drawn to that person just sort of automatically the way that we look for leadership in situations where we're confused. That person would then, whether they wanted to or not, become the author of the piece. Um, and so without, without having that person there, then my experience of it, as much as I can, you know, remember thinking, sort of projecting myself back was this state of initial sort of emptiness and the the sort of emptiness of the possibility of the space but because of I felt I was able to feel quite secure in it and sort of wait for for what was going to emerge so um and and then and then something emerged um the book kind of tries to describe some sense of what that is but it's really the sense of something emerging that you can't you also can't hold on to when you're not in parliament anymore. Like my, my experience of the whole event was also something kind of mind blowing essentially that, that leaves you with an experience afterwards but that's that a sort of feeling, a sort of like embodied feeling afterwards like leaving a sauna and being, just being in this kind of warm glow for the next hour or two. You sort of their parliament sort of had an afterglow for the next week or two that then that then dissipates slowly and you can't remember anymore quite what it was or you can't you maybe you can remember it but you can't access it mm -hmm. no it's quite uh, it was quite an amazing experience um there's you talk in the book about the kind of social nakedness that we are just there as a person in a space, but some magic happens between people in parliament is one of the quotes. So Michael, tell us a little bit, what is the philosophy behind social choreography? As I see it, like the great Man Ray, the American artist um, who started out as a brilliant landscape painter, a fantastic one, but he said, I can no longer work this way and moved um, then into photography, installations, collages, abstract painting, because he felt it's a truer uh, expression of the time he lived in. Mike, what is the philosophy? Why did you uh, stop? You worked with Forsyth, who you know, has the dances on the stage, a brilliant uh, a master, a great master of the 20th century. And you made that jump. Why? Why do you do it? What is the philosophy? Uh, I think, I mean, I've been sort of concerned with this kind of expansion of choreography looking, even when I was very young in, in my when I was 19 or 20 at, at, in studying in London, I was concerned with this notion of everything moves, everything has sort of some sort of patterns and uh, proportionalities of patterns uh, amongst it. And I saw movement everywhere. I didn't necessarily contain to bodies or human bodies or the human experience. So I was always curious about this, even though I was kind of trained and, and then sort of I guess the career path takes you into dance theater and experimental dance avant-garde. Uh, then I did contemporary ballets and all kinds of work before expanding into more visual art work. Uh, but I think at the core of it is that the realization that uh, our society is already choreographed to such a high degree uh, that usually is uh, at the unconscious level. Like we're just because we come in with a base reality of of patterning, of being patterned as a as a human through you know being baked within the system, uh, but once you see that either through deconstruction or through other kind of a just you know thorough observation, you notice that everything is patterned and everything has is sort of and made up to some degree, or most of it in our social sphere is sort of made up and entrenched, and then becomes sort of reality for us. So this choreography of and these things change. I mean, the older you get, you notice how things actually change in society as well. Uh, even though those those concepts that you thought were solid are actually totally fluid. Uh, and I was always interested in in choreography that that sort of plays on Derrida's thing that uh, politics is setting people in artificial relations. Uh, 
And I thought, well, that's what choreographers do all the time, just in front of a mirror. And that didn't make sense to me. This kind of a frivolous politics or or propaganda, really, because most of the time uh, choreographers are just re reproducing the order of the state to some degree, or the, the dominant orders. So I was interested in, in this. How can we access the social ordering, uh, the unconscious, and, and interfere with it or, or kind of meet meet each other there like it's like see is there a way to 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 immerse ourselves in this where the where, where part of the creation is still fluid rather than sort of uh and i'm using musil's word there the, the frisiker schopfungs can is, is still kind of a uh yeah it's still sort of a uh but the but humans are volcanic, yeah, volcanic, or like there's still magma. There's a magma of social relations, uh, and to get there, you have to kind of abandon a lot of the social conventions and norms, and and almost create a void. And that's what Parliament is. Parliament is really a void that opens up time and space. You lose time, you lose space by being there, uh, and then things start patterning again between people. But they are they are patterned around some what I can only describe uh, as a mammalian sensibility, like some other sensibility takes over. It's very real. It's very there. You feel very sane. Like it doesn't feel like you're playing. It doesn't feel like you're just crazy or, or, or doing weird things. You just feel like you're doing the things you really want to do. Uh, the brutal thing of parliament, I feel like is once you do all that and you feel actually really good, you it's over and you're faced with this, very cold wind of of civilization again uh and and you can feel it differently these winds that before you have blanked out you have sort of live learned to live and parliament also kind of creates a shock to the system because you can feel those winds again i think yeah and i am especially i'm interested in it and i think it's so important because it's a political work in its simplicity in its radical simplicity audience members are in the center they are the performers, the actors. I know you mentioned, you know, Brecht's uh, um, uh, educational place in this beautiful collection, actually, of books you suggest that people should engage with. So, but the idea is to act, to observe, as you say, to ponder uh, the sediments as something happens in it. And you wrote in the book, the system we live in is so powerful and all encompassing that thinking outside it seems impossible. And an imagination without training it only produces old solutions so that your idea really is uh, with this parliament to create a space where uh, we connect uh, in, in a new way. How does social choreography, the word choreography come in it? I know you encourage people maybe to follow also movements or invent or do movements. So why is it choreography? How I would you uh, define that? Even the word social choreography. Yeah, I mean, for me, that that is really the basis of that there is already all these, you know, movements, they're already occurring. They're already like, we are already so deeply structured. When I come into a classroom, even in the studio, everybody goes straight into a circle. The distance of me to my students is twice as much as the distance between the individual students, simply because I've got authority. And there's all these uh, invisible constructs that space and timers and, and kind of uh, create a certain kind of uh, hierarchies in spaces. And and so that this this is already at play, and if we if we are not careful, we're just replicating that on on stage or wherever we put our own creations, whether it's a it's a educational system or it's a stage. For me, that's all kind of one thing. <laughs> I see those patterns replicated everywhere, and and so taking this choreography as the as the that is already in place as the actual surface of one's own investigation of one's own. Uh, intervention that's really what social choreography is and then see where that can grow if you if you uh, create a certain kind of otherness or inject otherness into into these social uh, fabrics into these matrices yeah i mean it's uh it's something i and maybe also a question for for, for uh, corey you quote james hillman uh, the great uh, psychoanalyst who denounced uh, uh, psychotherapy he said psychotherapy is actually teaching people to cope 
with a deeply broken system to just, you know, get along with it, make way and find it. Um, and that it, he's felt it's wrong. Do you feel, uh, Corey, that, you know, the choreography we see, let's say the New York City Ballet or the companies that come and visit us, did they get it wrong? Is it teaching people to just cope with the system we live in? And they are not really asking them to be part of a change, a change they want to see. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 also a, a Brechtian idea. Yeah, we, we already you already briefly mentioned the Lehrstücke. That's what what I think of when you ask that question is is Brecht's criticism of or criticism criticism of the notion of catharsis in uh, in the theater in performance um, and the idea that you should that you should that art what art should do is kind of create this uh, this place for us as audience members to come experience a, a, a cathartic moment, laugh with the characters or cry with the characters on stage and and say, oh, isn't isn't that so true? Life is so life is so tragic. There's nothing we can do about it. Let's all have a good cry and then, and the emotions are released and we go home and we don't do anything about it. That's Brecht's argument too. Um, and, and that's also sort of a model, that, that's a model of theater as coping mechanism. Um, I think we have lots of models of, of the arts potentially as coping mechanisms um, or which, which also can be ways of understanding kind of our 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 built reality or understanding civilization or understanding our social reality as it is now reflecting that back to us um and then we can kind of recognize ourselves in the mirror not our heads um or have that sort of satisfaction of recognition and then go about our lives feeling recognized and um that's not what that social choreography really tries to unsettle that. Parliament tries to unsettle that. There are other art forms that also consciously try to unsettle that or other approaches to art banking that try to unsettle that. But yeah, I'm absolutely in in that camp that um that it's uh yeah that that coping is not really what we need. If we cope we don't we don't change anything. Um, or we have to walk, we certainly have to walk a tightrope between coping enough that we don't totally fall apart and become useless to ourselves and one another. Um, but but we also have to find ways then to uh, to not just brush everything under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, and Michael, we, we, we have that time of Corona behind us and we talked here a lot uh, about it and um... Has that uh, influenced you? Uh, has it reinforced it? Do you have new questions? New? Did it change you? Uh, well, obviously it was difficult in some ways because this is all based around which I haven't, which we haven't mentioned yet. Touch. A lot of it is touch in Parliament. That is a negotiated touch that doesn't arise from just a kind of coded handshake or something like that. And it's extremely hard to actually touch other human beings without codes but it's also easier than we think so it's a kind of an interesting state that one has to be in and the corona kind of eradicated that so we had to stop obviously all parliaments i mean just to think of a few hundred people together in a space uh, breathing and, and touching is not wasn't a great idea for that time so uh we went on and 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 part of it I felt like in Parliament, it's 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 like the basis of my work that is now happening. It's sort of everything builds on Parliament. So I, I, I did the next work. So I just decided to create a trilogy out of it, with the next work being amendment, uh, which really looks at object relations and uh, rather than just human to human, also human to non-human relations. And then the last work that is premiering uh, in a few weeks here at Duke is called Constitution, and that is again uh, something that is. Uh, already much more constituted that it, where, where, you, where there's order already present because parliament is really no you know no perceivable order present it's almost a, just a void of order that that makes the order then happening uh so the work has really started and i can feel it now that 
the parliament is really at the core of many of my thinking and corona is really sort of uh, manifested the necessity for that uh, even though it was like a wait for it to be over but it it was a for my own artistic kind of process it was a, it was very valuable in a sense of actually analyzing uh, and sort of thinking out of it and i think the book kind of was created during that time as well. Mm -hmm. true, yeah. Tell us a bit, how often has it happened where in the world and how are different reactions um, from the audiences? Uh, I don't quite know how often it has happened. I mean, it happened quite often. I know that. I mean, just had one here at Duke again. And uh, we have now an annual Duke Parliament at Duke University, which is interesting, where there's a lot of participation by Duke professors and uh, students and, and the community. Uh, there is... There's also kind of a wild fire parliament, like people just do parliaments. I, I taught in Impulse in Vienna uh, last summer, and they, there was a couple of women from the Ukraine said, oh, we've done parliament now for over a year or a couple of years in the Ukraine. And I'm like, I ne never knew. I said, and they were like, oh, you know, we're doing it all over the Ukraine. And and I said, where did you learn it? And they said, in, a, in Italy, and I've never heard of parliament in Italy. But so these things, and then they in Italy, they came from France. So that there is a sort of like an underground network of people who just do it, which is great. I think it's an open source. It's meant to be an open source thing. But you have to have done it at least once to host one, I think. And then there's sort of the official, more official parliaments that that uh, I host or, or, you know, people that, that I worked with host. Uh, and they are happening. They were originally commissioned by the Minaki Museum in Athens. So it ran there 10 years ago, I think, almost in, 20, in 2014. Uh, and then a number of parliaments. There was a big one here in the museum, at Duke University, the National Museum. Uh, and we've done parliaments really all over. In small ways, you know, if they're closed, sometimes they're closed. They don't have audience go coming through like the way we talk about it the way the book has been written out of what's all closed parliaments like just hermetically sealed but there's also this this uh, variation where there's actually an audience coming through it and intermingling with the with the people who do parliament and then being absorbed and you don't quite know who's in parliament who's not uh and in a museum situation you would have thousand people coming through uh parliament whereas there's just a a small people you know small amount of people that are actually briefed to the rules of it and that's these are different but they're also not that different they still work pretty similar strangely enough you often mention greece you also just came back how important was greece you also talk about the rooftops or the outside events there how important was that and is that connected to that democratic idea of uh on the original mm -hmm. forms of theater we all still carry with us Yes, but not explicitly, I would say. I mean, it, it happened. I moved to Greece in 2012. Uh, I married to a Greek woman uh, and we moved there from Ireland. And in 2012, there was a lot of trouble, a lot of uh, protests going on in, in Greece. And I embedded myself into the protests to sort of understand the choreography of protesting. And I thought that was thoroughly stuck the way people just had their positions and nothing really moved outside of their positions and it was like a uh it was a performing of a kind of of a pretend civil war at all times and i felt like it needed a kind of different kind of work to engage the political process at this stage and so i was in conversation with the Minak pinaki museum and they then commissioned the project parliament out of this experience of being embedded in the protests um now how that is of and of course by living in greece and and doing the first parliament even before the official opening on a rooftop on on either island in greece uh with with locals and some performers friends uh just to try it out it's it's undoubtedly influenced by greece and the entire kind of uh quality of thought the quality of life uh yeah. So, yeah, it is. And and I'm still kind of strongly connected. I have strong connections to Greece. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Corey, coming back to you as a, as a researcher, um, um, there are no photos, there are no tapes, of, of course, of the happening. So it uh, only happens in that moment uh, when people are there. How do you see it in the, you know, the history of the, the teachings in the performance art and theater art? What, what lines do you see? Where does that fit in? Um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, I, I don't know that I have an amazing answer ready to go for that, for that question. Um, I, I think, uh, I'll just, I'll go in a different, in a different direction that you, that, uh, that that where I thought you were going to maybe start asking, which which has to do with, I don't know what it means to to have a book about something that is kind of a a, a stable, somewhat stable object, um, a, about a work that is uh, that is ephemeral, of course. Um, that's also. Uh, that that's also sort of ongoing and and has um, and has this uh, sort of secret, not or um, what did you call it, Michael? This this network of other of, of other parliaments that we that nobody even knows are happening or that sort of bubble up at one point or another. Um, and uh, yeah, for. For me, I was interested in pulling together something that um, that would, or at least our 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 starting place was in thinking about like what kind of what kind of writing could you even do about this kind of work that would make sense. Um, you don't really want to write criticism. Um, it doesn't fall within those it, it doesn't it doesn't fall within kind of the standard aesthetic categories that criticism then usually follows and evaluates um and you don't really want to write a handbook or a description a, a sort of descriptive version of it because um a handbook couldn't really couldn't really tell you how to do it um and would then sort of fall flat and we wanted to try to to, to attempt at least in part to, to understand what a kind of parliament like a parliamentary experience, um, what kind of parliamentary experience might be possible for, for someone sitting and reading a book, um, which became an interesting challenge to think about because parliament is explicitly nonverbal outside of language and uh, a book, the number one thing we have to work with is language. Um, but in putting it together, I, I tried to, to work with dis the with with a, a disorientation that hopefully is that intends to be a comfortable kind of disorientation um, that you open this that you open this object. I have it here. Um, and you have to, uh, you have to kind of engage with it on its own terms. Um, you have to turn it. There are there are parts there there are parts that run this way. There are parts that run this way. So it's kind of it it becomes an interactive thing from the beginning. And there are contributions from a lot of other people who have done Parliament um, that uh, just generally like one or two page contributions. Those sort of interrupt the flow of it. Uh, there are a lot of sort of things that interrupt the flow or redirect the flow. We don't start with an, an explanation of what parliament is. We don't start in that kind of traditional way. And so the book, I think, asks you, or that's part of the intent, is it asks you to kind of immerse yourself in it, immerse yourself in the experience of going through it and, um, and shed some of your expectations about readership, about scholarship, about authorship, um, and uh, to kind of reorient yourself in within its logic. Um, and uh, the designer became also, by the way, an incredibly important part of actualizing that idea, Raffle Kozakowski. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there was a like I there there are basically like 
at some point, what I had put together were, were five different types of text. And, uh, and I, not being a designer, couldn't really imagine. I knew that these, these five different, different types of text, one of which was kind of the, the theoretical, sort of theoretical descriptive core of the book, another of which was excerpts from, a, from several long interviews or long conversations that Michael and I had, um, and another of which is the contributions from, from people who have participated in Parliament, um, another of which is the framework of ideas that's kind of an annotated bibliography that's at the end, and then some, some, um, some visual contributions also from, from people and things from Michael's archive. There's a lot of sort of different pieces and Rafa figured out how to then translate that into, into an object that you, that you kind of had to move through physically. Mm -hmm. And yeah, can I just say, uh, I think the book, what it does so brilliantly is is that it's not a book, or it hasn't turned out as a book as aboutness. You know, it's not about Parliament as such. It's about the departure from Parliament and the experience of Parliament into the world. Like what, what, how does that possibly translate into our into our world, or how could it, like, what kind of philosophies or what kind of thoughts does it trigger off, uh, and and sort of, it's an extension of how we, I remember Steve Falk, who is a dramaturg I work with a lot, uh, uh, very closely, when we, for a while, when we did after show talks, you know, like we, or after performance talks, when we did, the, for example, choreography for blackboards in New York, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, there was this, uh, we, we consciously decided we don't want to make, we want to have the experience of the work, and then talk about real things. Like with everybody who's in it, then we just talk about Occupy Wall Street or, you know, we choose a topic each day and we talk about that. And we don't actually talk about what happened in, in you know, in the sense of making it about itself, but making the experience drive the discussion of, of you know, talking from the experience of that work. And so the book does sort of the similar thing, I think. It, it sort of looks at the experience and then drives forward thoughts around uh how to meet this uh, you know historical time uh and and what to do and how to how to move now literally how to move how to create relations how to be in the world and and yeah and that's what i really enjoyed about the work about this actual you know the, the book coming out Corey's book uh and how it uh how it actually reads which is sort of almost counterintuitive. You know, you think like this shouldn't read well, <laughs> but it reads really well once you read it. Uh, yeah. so I'm excited by that because it sort of felt like this shouldn't read well. All these strands, you know, you're used to this kind of postmodern, you know, text architecture and you're already tired by before you pick it up. But this one doesn't do that. Strangely yeah. enough, it's actually, it sinks in and gives you a sense of movement from within. Hmm. No, it's, uh, it's, I think, truly in its form and content uh, represents the very idea of the parliament. You can also, you can exit it from any page. You can hold it from different sides. It's an open form and your work in a way invited <clears throat> um, such a, a choreography. Someone said, you know, um, a good typographer is actually a choreographer of text and images on a page. You know, that's what graphic design typography is all about. And you kind of represented that. I think it's a great achievement um, in this. I would like to talk a bit more about the idea of the absence of the author. The, there's these famous, you know, post-structuralist or post-structuralist thinking that Derry does where the author is no longer there. There is no, no center, but we so rarely see it uh, done. Um, Ranciere's great idea, the French philosopher of the spectator, as an emancipated spectator who's taken serious, not someone you teach. And that might be the big difference to Brecht. I don't think you try to teach anything to anyone. You take them serious and you say, what are your ideas? What are your movements? How do you relate to that person? And um, uh, Corey mentioned in her uh, writing, you know, people fall in love or break up and they fall in love again or whatever. So something really happens uh, in that space, in that time. So, um, Michael, you also mentioned that Japanese uh, koan, if I say it right there, the absence of the master artist 
But the participants, really, if you would go, if one of our listeners would go to that parliament, you are inside. You are in that room. It's about you. So tell us a little bit about the idea. Why do you think that is more important than, let's see, a beautiful choreography done by uh, um, Forsyth, a Fabre, a Bausch, a Balanchine, whatever? What, why? Well, I mean, I don't want to sort of criticize you know, foresight or somebody who's like a, a dear mentor, uh, has been a dear mentor in my life. Uh, and of course, foresight has also experimented with these other yeah. kind of ones. So that's also important to notice. The depot in Frankfurt, that great oh. place, you know, Steve, you know. Uh, and so, you know, for me, the stage is not the stage as such as a black box just doesn't hold up anymore i mean that's just a person i don't know if it's personal but in my analytical you know ability i've concluded that it is an a mental model that doesn't solve us anymore because this the frame that has established it is so strong is is already an expression of a particular way of thinking that i think is deeply connected to and we can go on to make the list from Christianity to all kinds of forming uh, patterns, forming collective patterns that formed that kind of idea that there is a an, uh, a black box or a void that can be filled in you know by some genius. Uh, so for me, that doesn't hold quite hold up. I can still enjoy it. That's that's you know. That's the interesting bit. I mean, I can enjoy it, and sometimes I feel like, oh, I should do this again, or, or something like that. But the truth of the matter is, I don't think that's what, what our society needs. I don't think that's what the planet needs. I don't think. That's what, I think what we need is a is a radical opening and a changing a, a new sense of a radical play to come up with the ideas, the sensibilities, to live in a you know, in a different kind of world, to construct a different kind of world for us in which we can live sustainably. And I think that task is set. It's obvious. Uh, if we don't want to vanish, we have to come up with different solutions. I'm not obviously not the first to say that. Uh, but we have to face the the answers. We all know the answers. We all know that these things don't hold up. They haven't produced the answers. They haven't produced the kind of uh, technologies. We know that. So I think the the point is how do we now go and face and really kind of try to do something else, and this is a trying to do something else, and it seems to to work well, in a sense of it really does something to yourself more than me, and that's why I do Parliament because it does that to myself as well. When I when I'm working in it, it gives me a different kind of sensibility of being in the world that I can carry on and carry past the event so it's a it's a it's a personal cultivation of a different kind of perception and yeah and one of something that does something that really draws me to it as well it did from the beginning is um that as a participatory work it doesn't really work like most participatory work or it's sort of it also shows that actually most participatory work is uh, is really really unable to let go of the idea of an author um perhaps more so in some cases than um than traditional proscenium work um because a, a lot of a lot of performing artists who make participatory work or uh, artists from various fields who make participatory work are so afraid of creating something that gets out of control. They're, they're kind of afraid of what people can do. And so there's all of this participatory work that has an incredibly tight hold on what it allows the, on what it allows the audience, what it allows the visitors to do as participants. And it's, you can sort of sense the fear of the author of this work. Um, and Parliament does not have that fear. That it's, it, it is really handed over then to, uh, to everyone who is in that space or, or who happens to walk through that space um, to, to make what Parliament is, it sort of trusts itself and trusts people um to, yeah. to do what they need to do That's and what they will do 
a major museum, and I'm not going to name any names, but just retreated from Parliament, you know, like on the, in the last stage of, of actually presenting it, uh, because it couldn't uh, accept that touch is negotiated and the danger of touch within a, a public situation, that you cannot uh, let humans kind of, uh, uh, you know, give them the responsibility of actually acting and that it needs to be regulated from the top. And if it can't be, cannot be regulated as an artwork, so it cannot be presented by a public major institution. And that was the logic, even though within the, you know, at this point, when we talked about it first, I think I said thousand people probably went through, I assume it's much many more people now, thousands of people that walked through parliament or experienced parliament. And so far, there was not one complaint. And of course, I knock on wood, there are always psychopaths out there, you cannot guard, you cannot, uh, but the fact is when people are aware, when they are attuned, and when they are attuning, usually things negotiate and touch negotiates beautifully, in fact. It's one of human superpowers. And that's also coming maybe from Greece, and you know, developing it from Greece, where touch is very differently kind of experienced as a in society as, as it would be in the US. Uh, I think that there is a, a lot of the magic of the work is that we as mammals know exactly how to touch each other. And if somebody breaks that rule, you will see, even in parliament, you'll see the rest of the group coming to protect. Like it's an there is a uh, a kind of immune system at play, a, a civic immune system. That's Jeffrey Gomery's term. A civic immune system at play that automatically protects some members, uh, and that's even that is is amazing to to experience. To feel like that there's not a randomness within it. It's actually quite. We are quite well organized in many levels as a as organisms. Mm -hmm. okay. No, it is an extraordinary example of a democratic art, of democratic art, a contemporary in a way, democratic, direct democracy art, a voice idea. Um, it's for the people, by the people, with the people in a way, and you also trust them and you say what you discover, you will discover on your own and it will stay with you, as you said, and um, and it is true, I did it and it it, it did. You also have the idea, which I like, you know, there should be a permanent parliament, like jury duty, Should people should do it like once, hmm. once a month uh, for uh, as a psychological sauna or whatever, or a political reawakening. Uh, the great German comedian of the time of Brecht, Karl Valentin, actually tried at his time to petition the Munich uh, mayors and said, people should be forced to go to theater and should get a, like a parking ticket if they don't go because he said who would go to school if you're not forced to school yeah. nobody would and the same should be um um should be also here for you uh, um um cory did it change your work uh, is your work now different after you participated in parliament my work is different through and with Parliament and through and with this longer term slow relationship with social choreography and coming coming to be aware of of social choreography. Um, so it's it's more than it's more than this one session participating in Parliament, but that is a huge part of it, of course, because there is a level on which this you 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 don't you. Again, you can't just understand it simply by talking about it. You can sort of describe the effect in a way, but, or and you can describe the intentions and you, there is there is theory connected to it and different and theories and approaches connected to it. But, um, but having, having the experience from the inside of then what that's like is a completely different thing. Um, uh or was was certainly crucial to me in also yeah you know seeing seeing what's possible there um and seeing that the things uh that we talk about are are actually possible and a lot of the time i think um i think one of the things that it does is help me to return to um 
to some kind of belief in what uh, what in in the power of in the power of the arts. I even hate how cheesy that sounds, um, but uh, the the problem is that it, the reason it sounds cheesy is because um, most of our attempts to to really do something um, artistically these days are pretty cheesy. We're sort of stuck, um, and this is a Parliament is an example of not being stuck in that. Um, so, yeah, it it. Uh, it reminds me that there are that there are things in these practices that are um, really worth returning to, thinking with, writing about, trying out, trying over and over. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, if someone would like to participate in Parliament, because I agree with both of you, it doesn't fit in a book, it doesn't fit in a video or in a picture. You can't really write about. It. You have to be experience it which actually is a hallmark of the art where can people experience parliament now uh while i'm planning a, a well it's in planning a major i'm some some no, can't dis, you know disclose exactly what's going on but i'm working on a major uh exhibition like a three months exhibition of parliament uh that will be running at a museum for three months non-stop uh so you would have thousands of citizens going through and that would really be the idea that the exhibition itself is parliament uh entirely uh and then i'm hosting smaller you know just we're just finishing you know ready to produce one in in columbia university uh we're kind of making smaller uh parliaments uh as we go along if you'll find them on on our you know if you subscribe to our mailing list and social choreography laboratory for social choreography at, at Duke University we just subscribe will will notify you whenever there's one coming out that we actually or that I oversee uh and and so there's a lot of things in the making there's not like an immediate big one coming up uh in the next few months I think but uh next year onwards I'm I'm pretty sure Sure. This yeah. also because we have so many other projects coming out of it. Yeah. Anyway, you maybe you have to also come back um, to the Seagull and um, uh, do another one. So Anytime. we stick to the permanent uh, parliament <laughs> idea. And <laughs> um, and um, I think it is really a worth an experience. Great for Duke University, you know, also kind of being a host um, of new ideas that emerge and is connected also to a university. It doesn't happen often enough that they also laboratories for the future and um and i think this definitely is we are coming to an end thank you again i again i encourage everybody um have a look also at this truly beautiful book uh, beautifully designed and put together um and as a as a little memory machine of a parliament what it is and could be tell us uh, roughly what are you working on now uh, what are you uh, what are you doing maybe corey you start a bit um i am working on i mean i'm uh relatively sort of i'm still i'm still somewhat new in berlin i said at the beginning i moved here in the fall of 2021 so i'm working on some research continued research around uh in particular work with water bodies um and trying to meet uh trying to meet my watershed here in berlin and figure out how that connects with uh with the watersheds that i know and work with in wabanaki maine mm -hmm. michael uh i'm working on numerous things through my lab uh, one is uh this work con called constitution that will premiere on the 17th of april here at duke at the rubenstein art center uh, and that's going to be also an immersive experience uh, of a different kind uh, so anybody who's around welcome to join and i'm working on a bigger production for the athens festival uh with the uh, ensemble and dynami which is an inclusive ensemble in greece uh so that's gonna premiere this summer called the utopians which is a, a also a theater play by robert musi called the schwärmer it's like a, so we it's not we don't do a theater play we do a situation a site a choreographic site but it's has some parallels going 
Uh, and we're also involved in this uh, next cultural institution research, me and Corey actually with Steve Falk uh, and others, where we discuss what the next cultural institution could look like, what a blueprint could look like that is not a theater, not an opera house, not a museum, but actually... Social choreography on the level of institutions, on yeah. institutional How level. We institutionalize these processes. Uh, so that's what we're involved in uh, at the moment. Fantastic. I think these are all the new ideas we uh, really need. We need to try out to save us, to save the planet, also, you know, to give an impulse um, um, to the theater. I mean, Schechner in his famous Dionysus in 69, actually, also audience members uh, lie on the floor. And it starts out like this, but then it moves into the play, which at the time was the right thing and the great thing to do. But now we we moved on and, and perhaps, you know, these three, five, six hours uh, um, experiences you choreograph as instruction-based art. And I also want to uh, put that in. Um, and this is a, an art form, which is in the visual arts a bit more also known often. It's an instruction-based art where the artist takes a step back, is no longer in the center um, of it, but puts the people in. And I think um, this is something what we really uh, need to pay close attention to experience ourselves um, for um, the times we live in and the times um, that are coming. So it's a great contribution. I like also the choreographic sites uh, as a description for your new work. That's fantastic. So thank you both of you uh, from uh, Duke and from Berlin for joining us. It's a, a beginning of our season. And I think um, this makes a big contribution to what we are looking for, the new forms of theater, of performance we need for the new times we live in and that everything is different, even so it's the same, but everything is different and we have to represent it on the stages, in the places, in the parks, outside and inside where we are. So stay tuned for our next programs. Thank you all for listening. We're having our live opening of the Siegel Center of uh, Brecht on Brecht and Müller on Müller. We collaged um, uh, um, uh, works uh, from these great thinkers of theater who also we feel um, have something to say for the times we live in. And um, I hope you will stay with us. Thanks for HowlRound, Thea and Vijay for hosting us, uh, the great, uh, uh, Talia Rosenthal, who joined the Siegel Center, helped to make this happen. Again, both of you, thank you. And I hope um, to see you both soon and also to our audience members uh, to see you soon. Come to the Siegel Center, stay in touch and um, let us know what you are doing, what you would like to see us doing. And um, congratulations, Michael and uh, Corey, of getting this really beautiful book done. So much is being presented and it should be documented much more. Visual artists do it much better. We also at the Siegel have to learn to do it better, but you put so much work and time into it. It's a fantastic example, exactly how it should be. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.